the Timaeus. Readers of Plato's Republic, especially if they focus on the theory of forms we've been looking at, tend to come away with the impression that Plato isn't really interested in the natural world, the world we experience and live in. That instead, he thinks all the action, so to speak, is in the intelligible world, where the truly real things are, the forms. But Plato actually devotes a whole dialogue to a discourse on the natural world. This is the Timaeus. And this work, rather than the Republic, was taken to be the definitive statement of Plato's philosophy in the later tradition. Look at the portrayal of Plato as one of the two central figures in the painting by Raphael called School of Athens. That's Plato on the left, our left, pointing upward to the realm of forms, even though they are not literally up there in the sky, just away from and beyond our experience and compare him to Aristotle on the right, pointing in the opposite direction. Now that's a story we'll come to soon. But for now, look at the name of the book Plato is holding, the Timaeus. That's how important a place in Plato's thought that dialogue has been recognized to play in the tradition. Now the Timaeus is structured as a dialogue between Socrates, Timaeus, and Critias. But most of it is a long cosmological discourse by Timaeus, an astronomer and mathematician, who was asked to give an account of, quote, the origin of the world, of the cosmos, and concluding with the nature of human beings. That's the part of the dialogue we will focus on, and it starts at 27C. Now, cosmology is what the pre-Socratic naturalists were engaged in those who focused on the changing world and tried to understand it. Plato, by contrast, has presented us with his theory of forms, according to which the changing world is merely an image or likeness of the true reality. So Timaeus warns his audience that as a result, the account he gives of this likeness world is only a likely story, an ekos logos, not literally and precisely true in every respect. Now, just which parts of Timaeus's story we aren't supposed to take literally is disputed. Now, a key player in this likely story is a divine craftsman. In Greek, this is a demiurgos, hence he tends to get called the demiurge. The demiurge looks to the world of the intelligible forms and makes replicas of them in the visible world by imposing order on some primordial soup stuff that, prior to his intervention, is in discordant and disorderly motion. He will later call this stuff the receptacle of being. Think of it as a cosmic Play-Doh or quivering jello. It's important that it be in motion, but in disorderly motion. Now, by working up this stuff so that it resembles the beings in the intelligible world, the demiurge produces copies or likenesses of the forms. So the results are the beings in the world of our experience. And in fact, we are among those beings. To the extent that these things, and we ourselves, are real, it is because the demiurge has imposed order on that disorderly changing stuff. The product will still be subject to change, but those changes will be orderly and intelligible, at least to the extent that they approximate the intelligible forms. At the most general level, this creation story describes a process in which reason imposes order on necessity, where necessity is that pre-existing stuff that both presents a problem for reason to solve, how to clean up this mess and make it orderly, and also imposes constraints on what reason can achieve as a solution. For example, if all the material you have at hand is wood and you want to build a bicycle, then there are limits to the quality of workmanship that you can achieve, however brilliant the design. The demiurge addresses this sort of problem on a cosmic scale. Thus, 
According to the Timaeus, there are two sorts of explanations you can give to anything that happens in the natural world. You can appeal to the goodness or order in it, for example, explaining why a wise creator would have made it happen that way. Or you can appeal to the constraints of material necessity, why it had to happen that way, even if it's not best, but simply because that's the nature of the materials the wise creator is working with. Let's look at two features of the cosmological story that Timaeus tells to get a sense of the sort of goodness and order that Plato thinks is built into the structure of the universe. The first will be the structure of what he calls the world soul. The second will be the structure of the material elements.